Primary control with critical vehicle function. Welcome to Zukunft Denken, Thinking the Future. This is an exceptional episode, not only because of my guest, but also because of the fact that this is the first episode in English in a generally German-speaking podcast. I might make the odd exception also in the future. Das ist heute ausnahmsweise eine englischsprachige Episode. Es würde mich freuen, wenn Sie dabei bleiben. Andernfalls geht es in Zukunft wieder deutschsprachig weiter. In today's episode, I'm excited to welcome Sion Lights. Sion Lights is a science communicator who is known for her environmental advocacy work. She's founder of Emergency Reactor and the author of The Ultimate Guide to Green Parenting, the first evidence-based book of its kind. Sion is also an astronomer and she has given a TED talk on stargazing. On this note, please have a look on the show notes. You will find links and references to all mentioned topics and references in this podcast. She's also the former editor of The Hourglass, Extinction Rebellion's print newspaper and a former spokesperson for the group. Seen is active on Twitter, you will find the Twitter handle in the show notes. You can also sign up to her mailing list, also to be found in the show notes. The overarching topic of this episode is activism. I already talked about activism, let's say, in the footnotes of other episodes, such as episode 45, 39 and 37. Activism clearly plays an important role in our world to change things, hopefully for the better, and exactly this hopefully is the term I'm discussing with Sion. What is the role of activism in our world? How can activism go wrong? Activism is, also historically, very strong on the side of reason, but increasingly also on the side of nonsense. What role does science play, and maybe more importantly, what is the interaction between good science and good activism? We talk about naturalistic fallacies and the precautionary principle. And finally, we touch the important topic of risk communication. Now, without further ado, my conversation with Sion Lights. Hello, Sion Lights. Uh, I'm very pleased that you found time to join me today in a conversation. Hello, thank you for having me on. Actually, how should I say I stumbled upon you over Twitter? Because you're, I think, in the space of activism for some time. You also have some TED Talks and so on. Maybe I would like to start with a personal question. How did you, how did you come to environmental activism in the wider sense? I got involved with environmental activism quite young, actually. When I was really little, I was trying to get my parents to recycle glass. It was before um, recycling was really a thing. You know, you couldn't really just leave it on your doorstep. You had to take it all the way to the bottle bag. And it used to annoy them. And people thought that it was strange, but I'd learned about global warming, which is what we called it at school then. And I was worried about it. And it was strange to me that no one else was worried. Um, and then, you know, I got older. I started trying to do more things. I sort of went vegetarian, got involved with a local Greenpeace group. And then I went away to university and I got involved with the first, we set up the first kind of environmental group there. And we, we also did things around human rights. So I had a very, always had a very strong sort of social conscience. And then the first, but the first proper activist group that I got involved with was Camp for Climate Action. That was around 2008, 2009. Um, it was a short lived group, quite similar to Exit Rebellion in many ways, but didn't really take off. And every year we'd squat a piece of land in the UK for a week and we'd live there very sustainably. And we do sort of workshops and trainings on how to be an activist. And then we do actions around uh, at the same time around the city. So wherever we were, so, you know, we went to the King's North coal fire power station and we, we did an action there and we did one at um, the RBS banks in Edinburgh during the Edinburgh Fringe Festival because, you know, RBS was investing in tar sands. So I very heavily got involved quite quickly then because, you know, for me, I'd cared since I was a kid and I didn't really have an outlet. And now suddenly it seemed like here was an outlet. So we did a lot of direct action, you know, um, as rested multiple times. So, it's not new to me at all. And yeah, Extinction Rebellion is recent, but to me, it's really not that different than the group that existed, you know, 10, 10, 12 years ago, trying to do the same thing. What was very interesting for me was, though, I'd like to talk with you about activism generally a little bit later, but what I found very impressive was, from what I understood is you first, as you mentioned, were quite involved in Extinction Rebellion. And then I think you started to change your mind. You reflected on yeah probably scientific information or scientific uh, research that you did on your own or uh, articles and so on that you read and you came to the conclusion that nuclear energy is probably 
a quite relevant solution for fighting climate change, which doesn't bode too well with a large number of envir environmental organizations. And so, as far as I understand it, you then moved away from Extinction Rebellion to, yeah, I don't know, should we call it nuclear activism? And I found this very impressive because, yeah, you were a popular figure, let's put it like that. And you showed that someone can change their mind because of facts. Am I getting that right? That is right, yes. And I would say that pseudoscience is everywhere. And these kind of environmental groups, I don't know if they have more of it than other groups, but there's a lot of it around. So it wasn't it wasn't just nuclear for me. It was years ago I was offered a book deal to write about green parenting. You know, I was a co-editor of a green parenting magazine. I was quite well known in those circles. And I wrote this book, you know, about how to lower your carbon footprint using science. It was all evidence-based. I read all the studies. Um, they're all referenced in the back. And it was really important to me at the time because I was reading other green parenting books because I just had a daughter. And all of those books would say, you know, don't go to the doctor, use homeopathy, lots of woo stuff. And it made me really uncomfortable. And, and they'd be very anti-vaccination. So when I wrote my book, I said to the publisher, I've got to have a chapter in there on vaccines. I know you might say that doesn't come under green parenting, but it does. Um, these people need to hear it. And also it's a social justice issue. And I, I've always put that in with environmental issues. I don't think you can just take people out of the equation. It's not just, you know, nature and not people. People are part of nature. So they said, yeah, that's fine. And I put that chapter in and you would not believe the backlash I got. I mean, now I think people are more aware of it and they're seeing all the vaccine hesitancy and denial. But back then, people weren't as aware of it. And there weren't many people sort of speaking out, advocating for it. And I was absolutely... Um, I was cancelled. Uh, you know, there were news magazine editors that I'd written for before for free who'd said they would review my book, who emailed me very angrily saying, you're working for Big Shot Pharma. We won't review this. It was horrible, really horrible. And I, I'd never come across that before, but I realised, oh, this is what happens <laughs> when you have this opinion. So actually, I sort of had started changing my mind on nuclear years before, years before Extinction Rebellion, because I, I had been seeing good research and, and, you know, looking into it and thinking about what people were saying and hearing arguments from anti-nuclears that sounded identical to the arguments that I heard from anti-vaxxers, identical in a way that, you know, just repeating the same sound bites, not responding to evidence. And I started thinking maybe there's something going on here, but it's very difficult in those groups to go against those views because you get attacked and you get kicked out. And I wanted to do a good job for Extinction Rebellion. They asked me to be a spokesperson. I was happy to do that. I felt like I had a good platform to talk about climate change, so long as I could talk about the facts. And then all that sort of fell apart when you know, I went on the Andrew Neil show and he asked me about some numbers that had come out of XR and they they had been made, made up and I didn't feel that I could defend them because I knew they'd be been made up. And at that point, I realized I couldn't be in this group anymore because that's wrong. And the other thing is that he asked me about solutions and I really wanted to say nuclear energy. I really wanted to say it because he specifically asked me, how, well, how are we going to live without gas? What are we going to do? And I was sitting there thinking, I really want to talk about nuclear energy, but as a spokesperson for the group, I couldn't. And I just suddenly thought, hang on, I'm back in this position now where I'm close to making anti-science arguments and I don't want to be in that position. So maybe I've done all I could for this group, but I can't do any more. And, and actually, it's true. When I kind of wrote about then why I left Extinction Rebellion and the nuclear aspect, I did get a lot of attacks from people in that group who are so, so strongly anti-nuclear, like just vic viciously. So not all of them. And I have to say, a lot of them are from an old, the older just kind of C and D generation, boomer generation, but so vicious. I understand why other people then stay quiet about it. And that's why now I'm kind of dedicating my life, my activism to making it OK to talk about it because it's scary. It's just as scary as when you can't talk about vaccines. If you can't talk about nuclear energy because you'll get shouted at. That's scary. That's not good. We shouldn't encourage that. I see two aspects here and, and we are quite at the core of what I'm really interested in. The one thing is about ideology. I think people go into probably such activism because they have a certain ideology sometimes. And it seems to be very hard for people to not fit in thoughts that are contradicting to their ideology. And I think this is harming the climate movement a lot because in the climate movement, we have a lot of overlapping things, but maybe we come to these eco-modernist topics a little bit later. The core point for me is activism and I think it's quite obvious that we need activism in our time. And we saw in the past, in the history, I don't know, when you go back to the suffragettes or to the, I don't know, social rights movement, all of that in the 1960s and so on, it's quite obvious that small, or the comparatively small groups can have a large impact and for the good, obviously. On the other hand, I'm afraid that activism always has to simplify because you want to get your message out, the message 
allegedly cannot be too complex because otherwise people wouldn't understand it, although I'm not so sure if this is true, but I think that's what behind a lot of these uh, statements from activist groups. And this simplification has always the implicit danger of yeah getting it wrong because the world simply is not simple, it is complex. Is this uh, a challenge you're struggling with? I think, yeah, you've hit the nail on the head there. That's absolutely an issue. But at the same time, it's about how people's brains work, isn't it? It's about their psychology. If you use really simple phrases that are easy to repeat, that, you know, people would just start repeating them. Things like climate emergency, climate crisis, net zero, all this terminology came from Extinction Rebellion. Most people use it. They don't even realize that we sat down in the messaging team and we came up with that terminology. We started out with hundreds of options. We whittled it down to what is going to grab people. It's like advertising, really, isn't it? What's going to grab people? What is going to stay in their minds? And that is what we we stripped it down to. Sound bites are just really appealing to people. It's why advertising works, isn't it? It's why, you know, uh, people can be quite easily controlled with good messaging. So, you know, I, I recognize that <laughs> there are problems there and that it always requires a simplification that actually used in certain ways can be quite dangerous as well. Um, and I would say anti-vaxxers use it very cleverly and anti-nukers use it very cleverly. And it kind of gets into people's thinking. And then, you know, you say something to them about, um, you know, evidence about radiation. They'll just say Fukushima. And you just know you can't get past that ideology because it's so ingrained. It is it's really hard, actually. So I think a lot of the unpicking of that has to be done with better sound bites that are, you know, as scientifically accurate as possible or trying to convey a bit more of a message than say something like, you know, I don't know, clim climate crisis is quite a vague term, really, isn't it? But then it does make you feel like, okay, this is an emergency, this is a crisis, we should act. And that was the whole purpose, that that messaging was to sort of get to your feelings and drive you to want to do something. And what I've noticed in the nuclear space, and quite a lot of science advocacy spaces as well, because they're filled with scientists and engineers and, you know, physicists, really clever people, they're often not boiling down to basic messaging because they know that it's not quite accurate or it's disingenuous so they don't do it so they don't have those catchy phrases so i've started doing that in nuclear you know just saying nuclear is low carbon you know what's your problem phase out the fossils and even then i've had people say well you know should you say low carbon or maybe we should use this terminology or maybe that but it, you can't do that in really simple messaging you've got to get the messaging out there to overcome all the really negative messaging that people have taken on for decades because the activists have been very not scientists, they've been very creative people and they've come up with really good language that has become ordinarily used by everyone. And language is really important in activism. But I completely take your point that, you know, I think it can be dangerous. And I think sometimes it can make things worse. And, and there's no knowing with that. You know, you don't know when you're coming up with it, where it will go. I think it's always about forming groups, to be honest, because my feeling sometimes is people are maybe scared about the complexity of the world or the complexity of the threats. And complex discussions are not comforting in a way you know what i mean it's more like oh there is a group and i feel i feel like um, part of the group and then i'm willing to also forget about details or complexities mm -hmm. for instance i noticed it with the nuclear thing actually on my, on on myself so to speak because i'm i'm growing uh, grew up in austria and as you might know we are one of the few countries who built a nuclear power plant close to vienna and after it was finished we decided not to Yeah, started in principle. So we have a one-to-one a -one, uh, model of a nuclear power plant close to Vienna, actually. Mm -hmm. It was never never activated because there was a big anti-nuclear uh, protest in the 70s. And it's sort of like something that you grew up with. And I grew up in school and it was like, it became more like a moral issue. If you question the, the scripture, so to speak, the anti-nuclear scripture, you were like a bad person or something like that. And you were clearly stupid or something of that, of that. So because you didn't understand what, what's going on and so on and so far. And for me, it was astounding when I, and that I just started in the last years to reflect and reiterate what was actually told about nuclear energy, that of course it has risks. Everything has risks. We come maybe to that later, but a large majority of things that were said were simply not true or vastly exaggerated and i find this terrible that something like this can go on over decades actually mm -hmm. and that's entirely normal which is why i think it's high time that we picked all of that apart because we are in a climate emergency and we do need vast amounts of clean power and we need to be building those power stations now and instead they're being shut down in the west you know france has made a commitment to shut what 12 of its reactors by 2035 something like that they have the one of the cleanest energy mix 
says in Europe, and they're going to go the way of Germany. Look at Germany's emissions, one of the dirtiest energy mixes, you know. Um, but I think what you're saying about um, kind of tribal attitudes is interesting. I think it comes down to evolutionary psychology. You know, when you were in your group, when you're in your tribe, it's really important that you held the same basic views and you didn't go against those views. It's actually for a long, long time. It was important that humans did that. It's what differentiated you from the other tribe. So I completely understand that. And also that if you then have a different view, people feel threatened and they don't understand where do you fit? You know, what? why are you saying that? There must be some sinister reason. And I think actually we've got to evolve away from that thinking. We've got to just be more rational and reasonable and stop doing that because it is damaging so many things, not just you know, people not getting vaccinated, but the entire health of our planet is now dependent on us overcoming these ridiculously irrational uh, ideologies. And the longer you, the longer you are invested in in a belief, the harder it becomes to yeah to overcome it if it's wrong. I think it becomes harder to admit that you're wrong. Yes. Um. So, because I've definitely spoken to people where you know we've had a good conversation, it seems like they actually are changing their mind but they really don't want to say that they've changed their mind or they'll even say, okay, I agree with you, but I'll never say it publicly. And I think, okay, well, maybe that's a win. <laughs> but I'm not sure, but there's a lot, there's a lot going on there. I think for humans trying to just trying to fit in and trying to, you know, mirror other people and give into peer pressure. There's a lot of different stuff going on. But again, I just think we have to, we have to learn to be more rational creatures really. Uh, I think so too, but it's also terrible. Just, just to give you one example, because you said uh, France and Germany, I know a German German industry, relatively power intensive, and they're operating in different different countries. And they also operate in France. And from all the life cycle analysis they made, their operations are most environmentally friendly in France because of the zero carbon or more or less zero carbon nuclear energy. They know that. And they are a German brand. And and since months now they're discussing how to frame that because they're terribly afraid to say. Well, actually, our German operations are not good because we have a terrible energy mix. The France ones are really good because they have a good energy mix with nuclear. And they are terribly afraid of bringing this message out because it, they think it doesn't bode at all well with the general audience. Even though, interestingly, recent polls, as you mentioned, seem to indicate that even a majority of Germans, meanwhile, is of the opinion that it's not a good idea to shut down nuclear power plants. Yes, and especially among young, younger generations, kind of across the poles, across the globe, they tend to be a lot more amenable because A, they're good at fact-checking and they can go and look up research themselves and they will believe you if you say, look, it's in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, they'll go and have a look. So they have that kind of, um, because of social media, you know, and, and having to fact-check, they have that awareness that a lot of the boomer generation don't have. And also they're growing up under the threat of climate change. So they have a reason to want solutions that, again, the, the older generation don't have. But um, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on with the psychology of people. And you're right. You're right. They, you know, politicians will cave if they think lots of people are anti-nuclear. But actually what happens is most people aren't, just as most people aren't anti-vaccine either. But a small pocket are so organized with such good messaging, there's such good activists that they dominate the entire narrative. And you start to think everybody thinks that, everybody believes that, when really they should be looking at, at polls. You know, that's more important. Um, and that's what happened with Macron, isn't it? Because... He was actually a very good advocate for nuclear in the beginning, and now he's shutting down these reactors. And Merkel, you kind of look at her and you think, well, she's got a really good scientific background, which is quite uncommon in a politician. And she'll say things about how they're dealing with coronavirus and how it's very scientific. But at the same time, they've got a very unscientific approach to energy, phasing out nuclear before coal and ending up having to use more coal. So you sort of think there's a lot going on there where I think it's about trying to please the people but actually not looking at the research of well, what do the people actually want? And maybe we shouldn't cave to the mob, which is that small minority. Maybe we shouldn't do that. We are sort of back at activism, right? We see how strong activism can be on both sides, on the side of reason as well as on the side of, I don't know, unreason maybe. I don't know. And there's another thing that I observe. I don't know what's your opinion about that. In our previous discussion, I sort of hinted that I think that you have some... <laughs> A conservative position which he didn't like very much <laughs> i think but maybe let me explain what i mean by that because i think it's actually quite interesting i believe that a lot of people in the left and, and environmental yeah environmental movement are quite prone to wishful thinking and in a very interesting way and they're also interesting interestingly strong in solutionism what i mean is like that they have an sort of an utopia in their mind like for instance the renewable energy utopia is like is like something that is clearly uh, the fashion of the day and they think this is like the clean sun wind and everything is clean here 
And this is very interesting for me because it's actually, I have to detour a little bit further. I had a, a colleague, a professor actually at, at my university who told me nuclear is terrible because this is huge technology and undemocratic and large corporations and stuff like that. The funny thing is, if we would want to get renewables, quote unquote, to work, it would be massive technology. We would need smart grids. We would need energy storage that isn't even available there. And people don't understand that just because something works in the lab, it doesn't scale to billions of people. This is There are usually decades in between, you know what I mean? From the lab to the, mm. to the scaling. And people seem not to understand that. So what actually is happening is they are activate, uh, they're making activism for large-scale technology that is actually unproven. Whereas, and this is why I said you might have a move to the conservative position, what I meant by that is nuclear actually ripened over the last 50, 60, 70 years, and now is a technology that is pretty reliable. We know it's working. We know it's scaling, and we don't want to hear of it. Do, do you get my, 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 my drift here? Yeah. Yes, I do. I still think there's a lot going on there with nuclear, though, and I think that um, there, I think there are a lot of vested interests involved as well with nuclear energy, where they don't want it because let's talk about renewables. You've, you've mentioned renewables. Renewables, the way some people treat renewables is like solar is the modern day sun god. Like honestly, and I say that of even some of my friends, the way that they talk about it, the way that they think it will save all of humanity, even though it's never been shown to do that anywhere, even though Germany has spent lots of money on renewables and tried to kind of scale scale up, you know, the blind the blindness involved with following that is, it, it, I find it really fascinating actually. And I wonder, I wonder where it comes from. And if it's just this idea that, you know, well, it comes from because it's to do with the wind and sun. It's natural and it's beautiful and we should worship it. I wonder if it's even as simple as that. But then I think, well, you could make that same argument for nuclear, right? <laughs> I mean, how do you think our sun works? You know, what is fission? But then I but I think those things are still more complicated than the idea of a breeze, you know, or sunshine powering us. And it really has become almost like a religious sort of thinking among some people. And therefore, no matter what facts you give to them, no matter what numbers you show them, they can't see it. They cannot change their minds. And that's actually the biggest barrier to nuclear because then they think, oh, well, you don't need it. So I'm not even going to look at it, even if they're not anti-nuclear. But a lot of the people who are anti-nuclear, they genuinely believe that 100% renewables will save the world. And unfortunately, you've even got some really dodgy scientists who are crunching out papers claiming that that, that, that that is possible. I don't know if you're following any of that, but really awful, especially out of sort of Stanford University, these papers coming out. And that shouldn't, that's a failure of science. You know, that's a failure of science. Just like with vaccinations, everybody wants to blame the anti-vaxxers. Sure, yeah, okay, that's easy. But there was a failure of science there, right? Because Andrew Wakefield published that paper on MMR saying that it causes autism. That paper was published by the Lancet. How did that paper pass peer review? It only used 12 children. It turned out that he hadn't got permission from the parents to test on those children. A lot of those children already had disabilities. There's numerous things when you look at it. And actually, it was an investigative journalist that went and found that out. As Brian Deere did a whole report on it. It wasn't scientists. Then they retracted the paper. By then, the damage was done. It was too late. And the damage is being done by all of these people who are claiming constantly that there is sufficient evidence to run the world on 100% renewables when actually there really isn't. The basic arithmetic doesn't add up. You only look at something like, you know, David Mackay, so David Mackay's work. And the numbers are there. The numbers don't lie. You know, you can have whatever ideology you like, but the numbers don't lie. And this is a conversation I find myself having a lot. And it's, I would say it's the plate, the space that people will, it's hardest to budge people in. They cannot stop worshipping this idea of the sun and the wind are going to, to save us because it's nature. Nature's going to save us. It's it's that simplistic and I haven't, I still haven't really worked out a way to unpick that. I think there are two general topics in there. The one is, again, as you said, a sort of a naturalistic fallacy, which is really surprising because, again, people, as you said, oh, there's a breeze, there is some, this must be natural. But people do not understand that if you want to harness huge amounts of energy from wind and solar, you need massive installations, massive installations. You have to fill up countries with uh, wind and solar. And we don't even have nobody in on this planet, as far as I know, has a large scale smart grid operational. So this is all unproven technology. So on the one hand, you exactly. claim on the, on, on the one hand, you claim nuclear is so terrible because it has risks. And on the other hand, you propose a technology that is nowhere 
operational, nowhere. I've got, an some, e yeah? I've got an even better example. There's a really well-known environmental writer here. He's been doing this sort of thing for decades. Very well-regarded person. He didn't like that I started doing nuclear activism. He actually wrote a big article about it, put it on the Greenpeace site. But he wrote a piece in The Guardian. And in that, it's very recent. It was just you know, a month or two ago. And, and in that piece, he said, you know, environmentalists should not be pushing for techno fixes like nuclear. They should not be pushing for them. And in the next sentence, he said, only renewables will get us out of this. And I just was like, my jaw dropped. What are you saying renewable technology isn't technology? And in that same article, he talks about how we need to have these huge grids, you know, connecting everything. And that that's vast amounts of technology. Where are we going to get the resources for all of that? Because you know, and I know, it's far more than nuclear, right? It's far more. And then it has to, re the panels and things have to be replaced in 30, 40 years. You know, they won't run for as long as a nuclear power plant. They won't be as reliable. They're backed up by fossil fuels. There's so many things in there. And I just, I, I, you know, I, I, how do you respond to that kind of thinking? How do you respond? I tend to think, all right, that's like the fundamentalist anti-vaxxers. You don't, you don't engage with them. You go around because they are, we're always taught in science communication. There's that's that small group that will not change its mind, learn to identify it and ignore it. There's a second, there was a second stream of topics that you opened. I'm not sure if you want to dig into that because it's a thing that it's very interesting to me, but. You brought the Wakefield case, and Wakefield is clearly uh, was clearly a terrible study, and and had a lot of uh, I don't know repercussions about the whole autism and, and all this nonsense. But this was clearly and obviously a bad study that was then in the end retracted, and even though it was retracted, the anti-vaxxers are still referring to it. So this is clearly delusional. I believe we have a much much deeper problem with science in the sense that. The incentive schemes in science became so strongly dependent on funding, on money, that I see a, la a, a, a increasingly large amount of really, really bad science from rather established institutions, which is, I think, explainable by these incentive schemes. That, that is not to say that all science is bad, of course, there's a lot of good science. But what I'm saying is, you often hear, and this is why I'm so skeptical about these phrases like follow the science and that stuff. I made an own episode about that. Because science is messy, science is complicated, and science is also bad on occasion. And, uh, and it's not so easy to say follow the science for the numbers because there's a lot of bad science and a lot of bad numbers out there. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. It's absolutely true. And, um, you know, th there, are there are many issues. It's still the best thing we've got. It's still the best. The scientific method is like the best thing, right, for humanity. This is great. But there are lots of human biases in there. That's what peer review is meant to deal with. And I don't think it is quite a lot of the time, actually. When you look at things that get published, I don't think they're quick enough to retract things. Also, I think once you once it's published, it's just done. So like with, with MMR, I have spoken to anti-vaccinators and I've said, well, you know, actually, you know, are you sure you trust this man who did these things to these children without getting their parental consent? You know, does that sound like someone who cares about children? And, you know, he's struck off as a doctor, all of this stuff. And they would say, oh, wow, that's all a conspiracy to cover it up. That's why it was retracted. So once it's there, it's done. The damage is done. There have to be better checks and balances. There has to be, I don't know, a lot more critical thinking about what gets published and maybe things get published with caveats. I don't know. I know there's a good new system that they're, they're using at the moment called preprints. I don't know if you've yes. heard of that. Yes, and yes, actually, sure. and I know that that, you know, it could still have dangers because you might get a journalist writing something about something that's completely wrong. But to be honest, I think that happens anyway. And at least with the preprints, from my, what I've seen, people, when you've got lots and lots of people, you know, you think when you put something on Twitter and you get loads of people like tearing it apart, that's actually really useful. And I think that's actually really good because people it is working and people are picking out things yeah. because there's so many of them and they, they are sharp and they are paying attention. So maybe that will help in some ways to improve that process. But we really have to do better. We really have Definitely. to. And I, I find this all the time when I speak to scientists. I speak to scientists all the time as part of my work. And all of the blame, they put all of the blame on ordinary people not understanding science. And I just say, you can't. No, it's not. No. That's not true. It's not. No. That's not. Yeah. No, that's not true. And I think I think everyone has to do their homework. And I'm really terrified that i mean some branches of science think for instance of the of the psychologists who had this uh, huge crisis reproduce reprodu uh, reproducibility crisis so they couldn't reproduce a, a large number mm -hmm. of their things and they started to clean up their house a little bit and started to redo a lot of procedures and studies i think that's a good a good first step but we have this problem in many areas of of science and by the way peer review 
is something that is a very new thing. We didn't have peer review on the on the large scale since the 1960s. Mm -hmm. So um, peer review is, I think, the, one of the most overrated things that is actually um, what I would call a general scheme that we observe in management and politics, what I would call fear-driven management. So you are afraid to make a decision and you try to find justifications for the decision you know what i mean because in the past you had think of like uh, scientific genres like nature nature had an editorial board and they actually discussed submissions in the editorial board to say okay is this good is this not good so they they made a decision because that's your you're a magazine you're supposed to make the decision mm -hmm. and i think they are afraid of very more and more afraid of doing so and then let's do peer review and peer review at best filters out the absolute worst stuff but still it is prone to a lot of other systemic errors, uh, circular referencing and all such stuff. So I think we really have to clean up a lot in the science field as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, it's something I talk about a lot. People do get very, um, they get very, very upset about it, very protective, but we have to recognize the sheer number of times that we failed. We failed. We've not been good communicators. And actually, the communication thing has really only taken off in the last sort of decade. Now, more and more, you know, university departments, even government bodies will have, you know, someone working in a science communication unit because they realize that otherwise they're sending out these really complex bits of data to journalists. And journalists don't have any science training. Usually even even science correspondents won't necessarily. And they will accidentally or on purpose because it makes a better story misinterpret and misrepresent the evidence that you've given them and that can also be very dangerous and we see it happen all the time with vaccines gmos you know everything 5g how these things spread and now you've also got the rise of social media so you've got just ordinary people with no journalistic training or anything so no ethical standards necessarily going and making a youtube video um, i think there was one on the new coronavirus vaccine wasn't there on one of them and it was so quickly amassed millions of views i didn't watch it it was taken down by the time i'd heard of it but people watched it and believed it you know and then when it was taken down they said they're covering up a conspiracy it's so hard and i think that's a, a new challenge that we're going to have to deal with actually and i don't think that the people who are running these sites like YouTube and Twitter really understand the repercussions. I mean, look, look on Twitter. I see people with huge accounts, huge accounts, sometimes writing something so scientifically inaccurate and so irresponsible, but there's no way to report it. If you go through report option, there's nothing to say. This is abs an absolute lie. This person's got a blue tick. This needs to be taken down. And it, does, it doesn't get taken down. It's, I saw a, a celebrity posting anti-vax stuff just recently, and there was no way to report it. This is really dangerous, and they have to get their acts together. I don't know what that process is going to look like, but it's all feeding into the same issue that we've had for a long time. And I saw someone make a joke onto it yesterday saying that we went from like, you know, industrial age or whatever, te technological age, and now we're in the Dunning-Kruger age. It did make me laugh, but I kind of thought, actually, let's be fair for a minute. We used to be worse. We used to not have the scientific method. You look at things like medicine, the, the things that doctors used to do to people, you, you know, the superstitions people had. We used to be much worse. Science has made all of that better, really has. Well, in it's, many I, think areas. It, I think it's fair to say before then, let's say 1900, it was better not to go to the doctor or to go to the doctor because exactly. of, the amount, yeah, uh -huh. of, of the damage they inflicted to a lot of people. I would like to sort of close the activism topic with one question. There is... Activism has a start, but activism often doesn't have an end. What I mean by that is there is a rather harsh quotation from Eric Hoffer, who was a philosopher, who said, every great cause begins as a movement, becomes a business, and eventually degenerates into a racket. Okay, that's a bit tough maybe, but I think we see every organization, as, as, as soon as you found an organization for a good cause and, 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 and a reasonable cause, every organization tends to start developing strategies to keep itself running. That's an organizational phenomenon, not, not only in activism, everywhere. Companies, departments of companies, administrations on. So I see the threat in activism that you actually more or less reached your goal, but I don't know, the organization is running, the money is, is you know, you, you got good in getting money and all of that, and let's keep it rolling. So maybe the question I would ask, want to ask is, should you not define a stopping condition when you do activism? You know what I mean? As soon as we reach this and that, actually our goal is achieved? Well, I think this is just far more complicated than that because what are the goals of any activist group? What, what were the goals of Occupy? Occupy came out of nowhere. It was just a bunch of students, wasn't it? They didn't expect it to take off. They didn't have any strategy. It 
took off all around the world and then it fizzled out what did it give us really did it change anything it did it did the messaging was good the messaging is now you know that one percent everybody uses that one percent that came from occupy what were their goals did they achieve their goals not really i don't think extinction rebellion they had three demands did they achieve those three demands no not really if you look at the three demands <laughs> uh, none of those demands were achieved none of those three demands but the goal of getting climate change on the agenda and pushing for some kind of action on it, I would say that was achieved. However, if you speak to most activists in Extinction Rebellion, they will say, no, we haven't achieved it because nothing has changed. You know, they're setting targets, but nothing's actually changing. Whereas I think because I was talking, you know, I was doing this 10, 15 years ago, I have a, you know, a, a broader perspective than they do. I think lots has changed because when I was doing this 15 years ago, I was just called an eco-terrorist you know, and I was just treated horribly. And why is she doing that? No one cares about your issue. Anyway, global warming isn't real. That's the sort of stuff people would say to me. Whereas now most people do accept that climate change is real and happening. Most people do want action on it. The polls show even during the pandemic in this country, at least consistently, people are still concerned about the environment, and climate change. They still want to see action on it. All of those are phenomenal things that I think came out of Extinction Rebellion, Fridays for the Future, and obviously Greta. But Greta, you know, was involved with that so right from the beginning, before anyone knew who it was, and it was just a small group met in Trafalgar Square, she came down and spoke at this little rally. She took that messaging of climate emergency and things from us. So huge, powerful impacts that I think have been very good in the world. But in terms of meeting their goals, they don't feel they have. They're not going to back down. They're not going to stop trying to achieve those goals because that's their end game. But I would look at those goals very carefully. And I have done since more so since I've stepped away and been able to sort of you know, really think about it. And I think they're, they're rubbish. I think they're rubbish goals. I think they're not, they're not scientific enough. They're very vague. Messaging can be vague, but when you have goals, they've got to be measurable. You know, they've got to be scientific. They've got to be based on something, not just, we want you to do X. How about we want the emissions to drop by this much by this year? We want to see a plan to yes. see that that's going to happen. And actually we kind of need that leadership because even our world leaders, at least here, you know, our government's not very good at doing it. So we kind yes. of could do with that direction, but they're not doing that. They're very vague. They're pushing for vague things and then feeling that they're not getting anywhere. And in some ways it probably would be better for them to just fizzle out. But I also think a lot of these movements never truly fizzle out. I think they sort of go dormant and they come back as a different iteration. I really think Climate Camp so similar to Extinction Rebellion in many ways. And a few of us from th that group are still floating around. Occupy as well, you know, go leading into things like Black Lives Matter. There's a lot of crossover, but the group sort of go away, lie dormant, and then come back with something fresh. But whether or not it's better or going to achieve good goals, I don't think there are enough scientists among the activists to make sure that that happens. That's what I think. I think they're very separate spaces. Um, and I think that's a big problem, actually. I think the, the the activists, let me give you an example. Activists, you know, I've been on so many incredible rallies. I've sat in trees to stop them being cut down. I've done every kind of activism you can imagine over the years. And, you know, they're always fun places. There's good music and it's bright and it's colourful and people are friendly and people come and make you a, a vegan tea and like make sure you're all right. And they'll, you know, get you some food. And it's it's lovely, beautiful atmosphere. But then you sit down and you talk to them and you're like, wow, there's a lot of woo here. There's a lot of weird pseudoscience. OK, that's, you know, I'm just going to have to deal with that. They're nice people. That's me. Then I went on the March for Science in Bristol here a couple of years ago and it was all scientists. Right. It was all scientists. It's sort of the first time they're coming together doing this to stand up for science. And it was so boring. There was no music. There was no art. They were not artists. There was no good messaging. There was no mm. good chanting. There was no music. There was there, uh, even the placards. I, I saw some of the placards. I thought they were funny because, you know, they're quite clever or they'd have like a Carl Sagan quote or something. These things do not speak to most people. They're really nerdy and insular, actually. I like them because I've got a foot in both worlds and that's quite unusual. And that's what makes me a good science communicator. But actually, their messaging wasn't there being able to appeal to people that all that stuff the creative stuff wasn't there and that's why that didn't really turn into any kind of movement even though we marched all over the UK for science it's just completely disappeared now so there needs to be some kind of there needs to be more art in that group and there needs to be more science among the kind of creative activist groups you uh, you open a segue to a topic I wanted to ask you about let, let me just try to explain it I'm a little bit desperate I have to say because I see I see I try to paint it a little bit extreme now but just to give the contrast i see i see two brands of environmentalism at the moment one is what i would call like the legacy environmentalists like greenpeace and these people and i'm really really disappointed about many of these old 
environmental groups because they seem to lose connection to reality. They institutionalize, they conflate political ideas with environmentalism. In some sense, I would say they at the moment inflict more damage on the world than good, particularly in large topics like climate change. On the other side, you have a movement that I think is self-described as eco-modernism, and they seem to be more oriented to science, but more, how should I say, the danger there is that I feel they're often hyper-optimistic, hyper-optimistic to techno-fixes, and also doing what I would call scientism and not science, like doing oversimplistic statistics. For instance, when you read what the stuff that Hans Rosling wrote or Stephen Pinker records, while the Breakthrough Institute and these people, there's often, uh, I really want to cry sometimes because yes, some things of what they say is true, but it's very often very naive statistics and not understanding risks, existential risks. And I feel that we are torn between those two sides. And I have to be honest, I don't like either of them. What is your position? Yeah, well, I mean, look, Greenpeace has done some really good things over the years. I recognize that. Over um, the years, exactly, in the past. This would yeah, be my, yeah. And, and eco-modernism is trying to do good things. But it's exactly like those examples I just gave you, where Greenpeace has been really good at capturing people's hearts. This is what we always used to talk about in Extinction Rebellion. When you're looking at messaging, when you're looking at color palettes, when you're looking at everything, every, anything you're trying to do to get people involved, you've got to capture their hearts. That's what we'd say. And it's very unscientific, but you know, it's appealing to it's appealing to very simple human traits and that need for community and the need to have joy with people and listen to music or you know colorful branding and all of that stuff and clever clever catchphrases. Then I look at eco-modernism and I think that's what it's missing is the heart, right? It's just it, it's completely missing that. Who are these people? What do they really believe? You know, te techno fixes can't have a heart. To talk about nuclear as a techno fix, I tend to talk about exactly the same things I talked about in Extinction Rebellion, which is my worry about the state of the planet my worry about energy poverty, my worry about air pollution, climate change, all of that stuff. And then I say, and here's a solution. It could be spinach for all I care. And then I would advocate for spinach, but it's not. It's nuclear energy. And it has, yeah, some people have hangups about it. But I understand those hangups because I come from a community which has bred, is where those hangups are bred. You know, I was, you know, you talked about living next to that power plant and, and those sorts of things. I was only ever exposed to this thinking for most of my life because I was always in these communities. Yep. And they're very good at capturing your heart on things to be fearful about. And they put nuclear in there. And I think the thing with eco-modernism, I've looked at the manifesto, you know, it's very appealing. It's, it, there's lots of data, but it's it's very dry. And it, it I think it, it, lo it doesn't have a human aspect that draws ordinary people in. And if you're only appealing to scientists, that's already a problem, isn't it? Because actually they're not the ones you need to appeal to. No, I, I I think you have a very, very good, important point here that the emotion, the narrative, the story is important. I absolutely agree here. But my point with the eco-modernists was deeper in the sense that they claim to do science and be science-based, but actually they are simplistic. When you just, I give you two examples. For instance, Hans Rosling has this book where he explains how everything gets better. Uh, Stephen Pinker in the same in, in the same manner. Like I know getting numbers from the last hundred years and on how, how we improved, uh, how we improved poverty, for instance. And then when you dig one step deeper, you realize that these are simplistic, naive statistics, like these $2 per day poverty indicators, for instance, where everyone who is researching poverty will tell you $2 per day is, is idiotic. That is, that this is not a good indicator. And we still have large numbers of people who are hungry, right? Who, who are, have a yeah. hunger problem. So, No, this, the, the story is not as simple as Rosling tells it. And it's definitely not as simple as Pinker tells it because they make some numbers but don't understand that while the risk of a conventional war might have been lower to the average person in the West, the risks of nuclear war, of existential threat by a cyber war or by drone wars and so on is in a completely different range. Or as one of the breakthrough institutes brought the idea up, well, so what climate change we will be able to adapt and stuff. And Bangladesh should, should check out what Holland did. Clearly not getting the point that Holland is a rich country, has hundreds of years of experience, and an entirely different coastline than Bangladesh has. So my point is, it's not even scientific in, in many cases. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, I haven't looked that closely, but the reason I haven't looked that closely is because it's lacking anything to draw me in <laughs> um okay. and it kind of 
it's the sort of thing people think re- would really appeal to me. But whenever I've read anything, I think this is probably some of what you're saying, where I think also a lot of the arguments are in a vacuum. And I don't see things like that. I'm looking at a broader kind of wider picture. And I don't see that in the eco modernist thinking. And I know that there are efforts now to kind of revive it, you know, because there's been a lot of questioning. Well, why didn't it take off? Why hasn't it been popular? And they're trying to revive it and re- rebrand it. But I I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's the way to go. I think really the best thing that we could do is for scientists to get involved in activist spaces and bring elements of, prop, you know, critical thinking and research based, you know, decision making into those spaces, because those spaces will always exist. Right. There are always going to be these groups. And if we don't go and talk to them, then we can't really complain that they've got these terrible ideas because no one's challenging them. And it is hard. It is hard to challenge people. I know that. That's what I do every, all the time. But it does make a difference. And it's really important that we do it. Just creating separate movements and thinking that they're going to solve the problem. I don't know why anyone thinks that would work. I don't know why. It make, it doesn't make sense. And, it's, and if you look at the history of kind of protest movements, it's always been these kind of organic, passionate, very emotion-driven people, right? They're, they're never going to necessarily be the people that have the best grasp of numbers. But their hearts are in the right places. And if you get in there quickly and you you communicate important information to them, then you can help keep them on track and be a real good driver for change. And if you don't, you can write all the papers you like in the world. You can go and invent all the best things. You can go and invent an amazing vaccine. But you know what? If people don't believe in it, (laughs) because someone else communicated better than you, someone communicated really well that these things are dangerous, then your research is useless. Your papers are useless. Your theories even are useless because most people are going to go and listen to that really good communicator because he's got a really nice way of talking to them and he sounds very very important and, and, and oh, he's talking about feelings and I have those feelings. I'm going to go and listen to him and then I'm going to follow whatever he does. It's dangerous. It's happening all the time. It's happened across history. And we really need the rational people to get involved in that scrum instead of thinking, well, I'm better than them. I'm going to go and invent something over here. And we've got to recognize that intersection between actually that data can become very quickly meaningless, right? Look at GMOs. If people are going and slashing down the crops, it doesn't matter if you're creating this amazing rice that's going to help children with vitamin A deficiency. It doesn't matter because there are no crops. If you create the vaccine and people don't, uh, there isn't high enough uptake, there's no immunity from it. You know, I know you're nodding your head and I know they sound like obvious arguments, but you would not believe how many scientists who don't see that. And I have to convince them. And I even had one scientist say, well, my research is fine in my lab, Zion. And I was just like, I gave, I had to give him a specific example where that might not be the case. And he was completely, had never even thought about it. This is the lack of creative thinking, right? Never thought about it. And I said, all you need is some activist somewhere to think that and then go after you or your research and have a little following. And that's it. That's the future of humanity right now. I see it all the time when you talk about energy and climate solutions all the time. And it's dangerous and we have to challenge it. And we're not going to do that by just trying to create our own little theories over in a nice little safe corner where everybody thinks like us. That's not how things change. We know that. That's not what activists do, is it? They get right under your skin and right into all all of these different spaces. And there's got to be some of that kind of, um, you know, passion amongst the people who understand the numbers, frankly. This brings me to a rather concrete question, a follow-up question, if you will. One thing that I feel is extremely poorly communicated is risk. And uh, let me give you one example. And we, we can stay in the nuclear space. Like what I feel regularly happens in public communications of anti-nuclear movements, but this is also happening with other, other science-based uh, problems. Like what happens is like this. Someone says nuclear power poses a risk which is true. Every technology has a risk. Okay, so nuclear power poses risk, correct. Yeah? And then we, f- we follow from that, we, c- we must not use nuclear power because it has a risk. So end, end of story. So that's how the, 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 the simplistic line of argument is usually running. What is not be understood, in my opinion, and I think this is one of the biggest issues we have, in my opinion, in policy, is that you can never assess a risk individually. Every technical system has a risk, but you always have to ask, The question, okay, but what is the alternative? If I do not do nuclear, what do I do then? What is the alternative? And also, are the alternatives really feasible? Are they proven? Are they scalable? Blah, 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 all of that. And then you have to compare the risk, the one opposed the alternatives. And this seems to be unbelievably hard to make clear to a general audience. Or, or And how can you make this fundamental issue clear? 
Yeah, but um, what I would say about risk communication, we studied this on my master's in science communication, and it's actually very difficult. And in some ways, it's counterintuitive. So actually, sometimes giving an example of something you consider to be a similar risk isn't useful at all to the person, because so much of it depends on what their life experience has been. And making the wrong appeals can actually just make them hunker down even more into really awful um, risk assessment. There's so it's it's a huge topic, and there's lots of papers. And I always urge people to go away and read read up on it because there's lots of good free papers you can read. Just go to Google Scholar or something like that and put in risk communication because often it's the complete opposite to what you think is a good way of communicating. So even like I've seen this with nuclear, someone will say, "Oh well, you know," um, but but you know something else is just as dangerous. I'll give an example: something else is just as dangerous going going on a flight to see people somewhere or something. And I'll say, well, you know, that's a completely different thing argument because maybe they're going to see family or they're going to, you know, they're, they're deeming that as a necessary thing in their lives. You can't compare that to something that they don't think is necessary. You're because nuclear, missing. nuclear for them is not necessary because power exactly. comes comes out of exactly. the socket, right? Exactly. Yeah. So you're mm -hmm. already missing. You've got to go way back further than that. And, you know, and I have made the point to people where I've said, well, you know, when they talk very specific things like radiation or something you know i might say okay but let's talk about getting in a car you know cars there's a lot of risk there blah blah but again people see that as a necessity so they do understand there's a risk really they're just willing to live with it so a lot of it comes down to necessity a lot of it comes down to your own social conditioning some of it comes down to the culture and what you culturally believe in terms of risk which is different that risk assessment isn't different right in different cultures in some cultures they'll eat foods that have a risk of you know if that cook, food's not cooked properly you might die over here that's seen as very risky we wouldn't do that you know so there's so many factors at play it's actually very difficult to do really good risk communication the only way to do it is to get your sort of demographic graphic work out what those intrinsic values are and appeal to them on that basis there's no way that a broad messaging will work which is why it's you know there's a lot of fails failures here in communication from really well-meaning people because they're making so many assumptions about these people before gathering data on them and you have to have that data and we say this in science communication there's no public there's no general public there are publics and there are different publics depending on what it is you're, what issue it is you're trying to reach them on And sometimes we also use terminology that sounds good, but is in the long term very confusing. Like, for instance, in the European Union, the precautionary principle is a, is, is a term yeah. that is even, <laughs> even in the laws and so on. But the problem with the precautionary principle is that it is actually everything and nothing. Because if you, if you, if you take it literally, you cannot do anything anymore because Uh, you can never prove that something is safe in the long term. You can never do that. And, and, but it sounds very good, right? To a lay person, it sounds, oh, yeah, we have to be, uh, we have to take precautions. It, so it sounds very reasonable, right? But already the, the next steps are entirely unclear, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always say people should apply the pre precautionary principle to the precautionary principle. <laughs> because I've seen it thrown around, used for all, to justify all kinds of things. And it's everything or nothing, right? You can, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, I agree. And again, no, that's it's quite good messaging. I've seen people use that in Extinction Rebellion and, and they apply it and they apply it and it's it's quite clever messaging. It does it sticks in your head and, and you end up saying it yourself and think, Oh, where did that come from? It's because they've really they've taken that on board and they've really hammered it home in the messaging. But yeah, it's a shame when it's used in policy, you know, it's a shame when it's it's used at a higher level. But I, again, I think there's just a lack of people with a good grasp of numbers in those places. You know, it's very uncommon to have a politician with a scientific background. It's very uncommon. They have advisors, sure. But even then, you know, is that advisor a good communicator? Are you understanding the basics of what he's communicating? Actually, quite a lot of the time, no. You only have to look at the way that our government here in the UK has dealt with mask wearing or not mask wearing Or, you know, two meters apart or is it one meter apart? It's absolute shambles. And it's actually really sad this is, but it's actually really sadly eroded people's trust in science because what they've said is the scientists don't know. And I'm going, hang on, hang on. That's not true. You look at what the advisors were saying. You're very clear. The problems came from the politicians not understanding that research and then saying one thing and then changing their minds and saying another. And also they blamed it on scientists. They said, oh, well, the data's changed. No, 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 the data didn't change. There were things at the beginning that we weren't sure about. Sure, we weren't sure about masks that came in later. But once it came in, it was there, it was clear. And it was like, oh, well, we'll introduce them then. But in a week, well, why would you do that? Why would you wait a whole week? <laughs> is, it, is it serious or isn't it serious? That's, that's what people were starting to question. And they were getting very, um, you know, dubious about it, understandably, because the communication was so poor. But that did come from a basic lack of a grasp of science, like a really basic, like that, not understanding the scientific method, like not understanding the process. That's how basic it is.
Yeah, well, I, I agree with you, but with a caveat, because I think we also see a significant, uh, uh, how should I say, problems in traditional organizations like the WHO communication of the virus in the beginning, what Fauci said in the US, they also, and these were the science advisors, they said no masks are not worse. So we 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 have a conflation also in this of, of truths and facts and not understanding risks, not, not understanding yeah, existential yeah, risks. True. We had people who yeah. talked about uh, about evidence-based stuff yeah. which was entirely idiotic at the beginning of a pandemic and so on yeah so, but i think i think that's a difficult uh, that, that's true of this example because it was difficult because we didn't know a lot about the coronavirus but if you look at things if you go right back and you look at something like bse do you remember the bse crisis yes uh, the evidence was there and okay, the communication yes. was a complete shambles mm. complete mess, really mm. awfully done and you look at it now and you think what were they thinking of course that was going to enrage people and confuse people and all of the things that happened were going to happen because that communication was terrible. And you think that that would have gotten better now. And I'm not sure that it has, actually. I'm not sure that it really has. And until that changes, it's going to be a problem. People need very crisp, clear communication on these issues. And it's very hard to find that. Then you then you see someone in Trafalgar Square spouting out nonsense about vaccines. Hey, guess what? He's got really clear communication. Doesn't matter to me that it's made up. It's very clear and I understand it. And he's very passionate and he's talking about things that appeal to me. I'm going to believe him. You know, that's the danger and that is what's happening. And that actually that did happen the other day that they had a anti-vaccine rally in Trafalgar Square here. See, I'm really, I have to say, I'm really impressed about the work you're doing. And I, I, I started, and also really the fact, because I find this really, really impressive because not uh, you don't see this often with people who have some public exposure who say, you know what? I learned and I, I, how should I say, I informed myself and I changed my mind because of reason one, two, three, four, five, you know, this is very rare. And I find this is an extremely powerful example. And I started, started our conversation with a personal question. I would like to end it with a personal question because I observe a lot of people who work in the environmental space or who are concerned about the yeah, problems of a time that this can feel overwhelming and they feel like how can we how can we even get up in the morning you know considering what's going on everywhere can you because you you seem to be such a such a powerful person too can you give us some i don't know some positive message also like what makes you get up in the morning and what makes you positive that you can change something to the good well, I am a very lucky person. I'm a very privileged person in many ways. I wake up in the morning and if I want to put the light on, the light comes on. If I want to have a shower, the water runs just fine. If I want to eat something, I can eat whatever I like. I can go to the shop. I have easy access to food. I don't have to carry water home. And I think a lot of these points, you know, we take all of this for granted, right? We take this for granted in the kind of wealthy developed nations. But let's be honest, billions of people don't have this. Billions of people don't have this. And I come from people who migrated here in the 60s who came, you know, a really poor village in the Punjab and they don't have any of these things. And they cook over a little stove and it, they're coughing because it's just like, you know, they're just burning wood or whatever they can get hold of, coal maybe. And there's lots of respiratory issues. It's very smoggy. They have a low life expectancy. They have lots of health issues. They don't have access to any of the things I've just mentioned. They don't have access to medication. They don't have access to hospitals. This is billions of people in the world live like that. And I'm aware that those numbers are changing and that it's better than it's ever been. And I think that's a really good thing. And that generally humanity is going in the right direction. We are trying to lift people out of poverty. We are trying to solve some of these problems. But then you look at climate change and you think, OK, but here's a way that things are going to get worse. So for, actually, for a long time, I wasn't very positive. And when I was in Extinction Rebellion, especially at the beginning, I was starting to think I've been doing this for a long time. And actually, there's just going to be more suffering and things are going to get worse, you know. But I've never really forgotten that privilege and how lucky I am. I can get up in the morning and do pretty much whatever I want. You know, I choose what I have to eat. I choose what I wear. I choose where I work. These are things that most people don't have. They just don't have those things. Even in developed countries, they don't have a lot of those freedoms that we have. And I think it's really important to hold on to that and to remember that. And then to try and use some of that to do good. You know, even if it's only going on social media and arguing with someone who has a terrible view about energy, why does it matter? You know, people say to me, why does it matter? Why does nuclear energy matter? How about look at India? India's, there's a UN report that says that, you know, 40% of India won't have access to clean water within my lifetime, within my lifetime. And you just think, all right, what are the solutions? Maybe desalination is a solution. Guess what that needs? 
that needs vast amounts of energy, that needs infrastructure and all the development and things that we had. Who doesn't want people to have all of the things that we've had? We have a high quality of life. I never forget that. There's not a day that goes by where I don't think, hey, I have a high quality of life. I can put my laptop on now. You know, it's not even just about water, is it, or food. You go to these countries, you think they, it's not that they just want that. They also want laptops and they want phones. And, you know, isn't that an amazing thing that I have access to all of these things? So I tend to think... And they sort of have also the right to get this. I mean, because it's... Yeah. I don't know, so some Indian activist, unfortunately, forgot her name, once said in an interview, our poverty is not your... cannot be your environmental strategy to, to, the, West, to the Western uh, activists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sadly, some of that is happening. But that's why it's really important that we go out and discuss discuss these issues with people. And what I found very encouraging is I did a series earlier this year, I did this before the universities closed for summer. I did a series of university talks. So I went around about 12. I did it all over Zoom because of the pandemic. And I started out my first talk, I kind of was just talking about the science behind nuclear, you know. But when I got to the questions, all the questions were about my story. And obviously, I know this as a science communicator, so much of it is storytelling, weaving the facts into storytelling. But what I found really promising was that all these young people, they already care. They know they need lots of energy because they're growing up in a very technological era, right? They know that poverty is bad. They don't want poverty. They want to do something about it. And they care. And they care about climate change so deeply. And they're so worried about it. But what they don't have is the solutions. So if you offer them a solution like nuclear energy, they just pounce on it. And I find that really promising because at some point they are going to be the politicians and the CEOs of Greenpeace, right? It's just that, you know, maybe we don't have that much time to wait. But in the meantime, then I changed my talks and I started adding more in there about, you know, just showing pictures of my family in the Punjab, showing a bit about, you know, what it's like there. And they were so easily swayed by it, like so easy, just like, yeah, we knew this, but just thanks for putting it really into a context that we understand. And what that made me realize is that actually the good communication is not that difficult. The problem is that there's a lack of it. That's really good news because that means if people go out and do it, that's going to make a difference. So actually, if you're complaining and you feel depressed and you're not doing it, you're kind of part of the problem. And the best thing you could do is find a way to do it, whether you're writing, a, you might be writing blogs about things or you might just be on social media discussing these topics with people and getting these new ideas out there using terms like energy poverty, you know, changing the conversation from where it's been for decades you know, where nuclear is bad to a good place where actually abundant energy is a good thing to aim for, right? We're always going to use lots of energy. We're very good at finding new ways of using more energy. Look at cryptocurrency. That's not going away. We've got to find better ways of doing this. And actually, if you want to tackle things like poverty, that's the way to do it. That's the best way because how did we develop all of our infrastructure in this very privileged world? Well, we did it by burning lots of fossil fuels, right? Which had some bad repercussions, but we use vast amounts of energy. And actually, this is a really easy argument to make. I've never, never heard anyone disagree with it. The only disagreement I've had is from kind of the Malthusian types who say, no, 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 we should all just live with nothing and go back to nothing. But when I say to them, is, are you saying that we should not power hospitals? They have no answer because they don't actually want that. Even deep down, they don't want that. They think, oh, hadn't thought about that. And I say, yeah, because you're privileged and your hospital will have its power running 24-7. Guess what? A lot of the world doesn't have that privilege. And it's really a good way of appealing to people because they do think about it. And I, you know, I think it is doing good in the world. So I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy to do it. It is hard work and it is challenging, but it, it's if it's making a difference, then it's worth it, isn't it? Sion, thank you so much for the conversation. I really wish you all the best for your activism in the future and of course also for your personal life. And thank you very much. Thank you.